This is CHE 323, Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication, Lecture 3, Semiconductor Economics. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this course, and the reading material associated with this lecture is Chapter 1 in our textbook by Campbell, Fabrication Engineering at the Micro and Nano Scale. Last time we talked about Moore's Law, which is commonly referred to as a doubling of the number of components, mostly transistors, that are integrated economically onto a chip every one to two years. In the early days of Moore's Law, uh, until the early 70s, it was about a doubling every year. Then in the mid-70s, we diverged into two trends, one for memory chips, DRAM chips, where we doubled every 18 months, and logic chips, where we double about every two years. And we're still on that same logic roadmap of doubling every couple of years, every two years. Uh, DRAM has slowed down. Uh, we are pretty much maxing out on the, the density of DRAM, but flash has taken over the DRAM trend, and it's doubling every 18 months or so. Uh, they just released 128 gigabit flash chips, 128 billion transistors on one chip. Uh, uh, it's pretty remarkable. And the feature sizes for those state-of-the-art flash chips are on the order of 20 nanometers. A pitch of 40 nanometers, so the spacing, uh, transistor to transistor, center to center spacing of about 40 nanometers or a little less. Uh, pretty remarkable stuff. And uh, as we said, this is the economical integration of components per chip. We can actually integrate more components on a chip, it just is not the right uh, economic point. Uh, so the, the relationship between technology and economics is very, very important, and that's what we're going to talk about in the lecture today. We also talked about last time Denard's scaling rules for MOSFETs. Uh, Robert Denard in 1974 described the physics of MOS transistors, metal oxide semiconductor transistors. We're going to talk more about those transistors in, in a few lectures uh, after we get some more uh, device physics under our belt. Uh, but he said that if we scale the dimensions by a factor of lambda, as well as the doping concentration and the voltage and the current appropriately, then we get a transistor that is not just smaller, but also faster and uses lower power. Everything gets better when you shrink. As we saw last time, though, Denard scaling came to an end because we can no longer scale the voltage smaller and smaller. Our supply voltages for these Devices are now less than a volt on the order of 0.8 volts, and it's hard to make them go any lower because of thermal noise, which is about 25 millivolts in thermal noise. So Denard scaling is over. Uh, instead, uh, when we shrink a transistor, it tends to use more power and be slower. And we have to do lots and lots of work to modify that transistor just to keep it uh, working properly. Uh, and that's what scaling is all about today. Uh, so if we can't make a transistor better, why do we scale? The only reason is to lower the cost per function. Well, we can also increase the number of functions per chip, as in flash. Um, but the main reason is to lower the cost per function. So Moore's Law is about cost. Well, how does that work? Uh, well, we're trying to manufacture and keep the cost per unit area constant as we manufacture. So we squeeze down more and more transistors into a given area, but the cost of making that given area stays the same. Therefore, the cost of each function, the cost of each transistor, each logic bit, uh, goes down. But how do we do that? Because as we shrink, it gets more expensive, doesn't it, to make those things? Uh, uh, we know that fab costs have been going up. Uh, in, in the 70s, you could build a fab for 10 or $50 million, and today, it costs uh, close to $10 billion to build a fab. Uh, the processes are more complex. In the 70s, we might uh, build 20 layers of, of various things to make our, our chip, and now we, we will build 60 layers of things um, to, to make a chip. It's a much more complex process. And yet, the cost per square centimeter has stayed about the same, or it's only grown very slowly over time, over a period of 50 years. How has that happened? Well, there's actually three ways in which we've been able to accomplish this task. Increasing the yields of our manufacturing process, improving the productivity of our equipment, uh, 
and increasing the size of our wafers. Let's go through each one of those. In the 1970s, yields were quite low. A manufacturing process that had 20 or 30 percent yield, you thought you were doing pretty good. But over time, we figured out how to raise that yield. Uh, in those days, the primary thing that caused failures were defects. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about defects later in the semester, but defects are killers. If a defect lands where your transistor is supposed to be, it kills the transistor. If the defect's big enough and lands in the right spot. So reducing defect densities uh, has been a critical part of improving yield. And, and by the 80s, yields were closer to 50%. They pretty much doubled since the 70s. Uh, in the 90s, they went up again uh, in the 70 to 90%. So we had a couple of doublings of yield. Well, if you double the yield without changing the cost of manufacturing, well, then your cost of per working chip goes down by a factor of two. So we've had a couple of doublings here in, in those decades where uh, essentially the cost of every working chip uh, went down by a factor of two a couple of times. Here's the problem though. Once you hit 80, 90 percent yield, there's not much room for improvement anymore. You certainly can't double it. And if you go from 80 percent yield to 90 percent yield, well, that's only a small improvement in cost, not a big improvement. So today, the goal is to keep our yields high as we introduce newer and newer processes, and that's very hard to do. There's no more room for improvement in terms of lowering cost by increasing yield. The other way, maybe the most important way that we've been able to keep costs low as complexity goes up is by increasing the productivity of the manufacturing tools. We're going to talk about lots of different manufacturing tools in this class, deposition tools, etch tools and lithography tools. I'll use lithography as an example. Lithography is the printing technology. We buy these cameras that print the patterns of our transistors on each wafer. And these cameras are very expensive. I'll give you some examples. In 1979, you could buy one of these cameras uh, called a stepper uh, for about half a million dollars. By 2012, the state-of-the-art camera, now it's called a scanner, state-of-the-art camera was $50 million. So the price went up by a factor of 100. Now, it seems like it would be hard to keep costs low when the cost of the equipment you need to use has gone up by a factor of 100. But if we look more carefully, we find that the productivity of these tools is increased by that same factor of 100. In 1979, we were printing on 100 millimeter wafers. That's four inch diameter wafers. And these tools had a throughput of only about 18 wafers an hour. You divide the tool cost uh, over the, the area being processed and you find that it's about 0.65 cents per square centimeter for one print. Uh, that just the tool cost divided up among the area being printed. Now, you go over here to 2012, that $50 million tool is printing on 300 mil millimeter wafers or 12 inch wafers. And the throughput is now 240 wafers an hour. Dramatic. In increase in throughput. The result, the tool cost is almost identically the same as it was in 1979. And that's not a coincidence. These companies, mainly Nikon and ASML, that build these tools work very, very hard to keep the productivity in line with the cost so that the cost per square centimeter has remained the same. It's really quite dramatic. Now, in that same time period, the resolution of the tool increased by over a factor of 60. So essentially, we got 60x improvement in resolution for free for the same manufacturing cost. This doesn't even take inflation into account, which actually makes it cheaper today than it was in 1979. The other important way in which we've been able to keep the costs in line as the complexity of making a chip has gone up is with wafer size. Uh, that very first integrated circuit in the early 60s was built on a three-quarter of an inch wafer. And then very quickly the wafer size went up to get more chips on one wafer. Uh, three inch, four inch, five and six, we went metric uh, about this time. So we started talking about 200 millimeter and 300 millimeter wafers. Today, there's a lot of effort to develop 400 millimeter wafers, although they haven't been introduced yet. 
So what does increasing the wafer size do? Some process steps apply the entire process to the whole wafer at once. So if the wafer gets larger, so when you go from 200 to 300 millimeter wafer, the area of the wafer increases by a factor of 2.2. So if the cost of, say, depositing polysilicon on the wafer goes up by 50%, but the area has increased by a factor of 2.2, the cost per unit area has in fact gone down. And that has been a key thing. When we can perform entire wafer, whole wafer processing, one wafer at a time, or a batch of, of say 25 wafers at once. And larger wafers don't increase the cost of doing that process step in proportion to their area, that means the cost per unit area goes down. So for many, many process steps like etch and deposition, the cost per unit area goes down every time we increase the wafer size. The, the transition from 200 millimeter wafers to 300 millimeter wafers is generally thought to have resulted in about a 30% drop in the cost of processing the wafers uh, with identical processes. But not every process step works that way. Uh, we'll talk about lithography later in the class, the printing technology. We don't print an entire wafer at once. We don't have cameras that are big enough to do that. Instead, we print a small field, about an inch square, something like that, uh, you know, 25 or 30 millimeter uh, uh, on a side. And we print that one at a time. And the cost of printing is the cost of printing one field. So if I make the wafer larger, it doesn't lower the cost per unit area at all. Now, an interesting result of growing wafer size, then, is that those process steps that scale properly with wafer size become a smaller portion of the cost, whereas things like lithography, which don't scale with wafer size, become a larger proportion of the cost for larger wafers. So in the days of 6-inch wafers, 150 millimeter wafers, Lithography was about 25% of the total cost of making the wafer, processing the wafer. Now, switch to 200 millimeters, and all of that green area, the non-litho manufacturing costs, go down because of the larger wafer size. Lithography costs stay the same. The result is lithography is now a bigger proportion of the manufacture of that wafer, 33%. Uh, uh, and when we went to 300 millimeter wafers, litho costs are now about 50% for logic circuits. Every time we grow the wafer size, lithography assumes a larger and larger portion of the cost, which means the next wafer size transition will affect only half of the cost, not three quarters of the cost, uh, as in the past. Uh, so every wafer transition becomes less uh, valuable. And the transition to 450 millimeter wafers likely only to give us a 10 or 15 percent reduction in cost of manufacturing instead of a 30 percent. Well, those of us who study manufacturing technology for semiconductors, we tend to focus on the technology. And uh, certainly, if you're in chip design or, or device physics or manufacturing, these are this technology is what we're worried about. And we tend to think that technology drives things, but that's not true. It's the economics that drives the technology. This, I love this quote by uh, Bob Noyce. Bob Noyce was one of the founders of Fairchild Semiconductor, the first uh, ma commercial manufacturer of integrated circuits, one of the founders of Intel. Um, he, he most undoubtedly would have won the Nobel Prize along with Jack Kilby uh, if he hadn't have died uh, too young. But in 1977, a long time ago, he said, further miniaturization is less likely to be limited by the laws of physics than by the laws of economics. That was true in 1977. It's very true today as well. Economics drive things. How is that so? Well, you know, there are physical limits to what we can do. Um, and these physical limits can be thought of as, as brick walls. Can't go past. And we can approach the capability that the physical limit represents, but as we do so, the cost goes up. What that means is there's some economic limit that we hit. And once the cost reaches a certain point, it's just not worthwhile doing any more. Uh, as a result, 
My observation? The budget always runs out before the physical limits are reached. Well, you might look at that and say, well, uh, we're going to hit a limit and then we're over. It's done, right? Ah, but there's a little thing called innovation. We come up with some new way of doing things, and so the physical limit changes. It's not that the laws of physics changes. It's that we change the paradigm that we're working under, and this new paradigm uh, has a new physical limit. Typically, that means the costs are higher at first, but as we uh, go closer to that new physical limit, the, the resulting costs are, are lower, and uh, the economic limit is at a much, much greater uh, capability. So we need innovations, and we've had lots of innovations in the 60, close to 60 years in which Moore's Law has been uh, going on, 55 years. The result of all these innovations has been revenue growth. And if you look at the size of the semiconductor industry over time, for 50, for 40 years rather, from the very first days of the semiconductor industry till the late 90s, the growth rate was about 16% annual compound growth uh, each year. Now, any industry that grows 16% a year is doing really well. When you do that for 40 years, we go from an extremely small business to a very large business, over a hundred billion dollar uh, industry, uh, 200 billion dollar industry by the late 90s. But then things changed. The industry changed and the growth rate slowed. Today we're growing at about 5% a year instead of 16% a year. And we're a 300 billion dollar industry, which is a very big industry. But the difference between 5% growth and 16% growth is, is huge. Well, if we'd have stayed on that 16% growth rate till today, guess what? The size of our industry would be more like a trillion dollars. It would be three times bigger than it is today. So that slowing in growth rate was very significant. And the result has been uh, lower funding for R&D. Innovations cost money. And if your growth is, is lower, you don't have as much money to spend on innovations. And we're, we're have an R&D funding gap. We filled it with innovative ways of doing and funding our research, but still it becomes harder and harder to fund those innovations. The result, slower semiconductor uh, revenue growth uh, and less R&D opportunities. Slower revenue growth is a sign of maturation. Chips have saturated the electronics. Uh, industry, and therefore chip growth is now limited to the growth of the electronics industry as a whole. And electronics is starting to saturate the world economy. Um, you can only sell so many cell phones, we're getting them into everybody's hands, but after that, uh, the, the economic growth rate of the electronics industry will be limited to world growth rate, which will mean another factor of two reduction in growth rate probably. Uh, as I said, this means less opportunity to invest in R&D. So that's the state of the semiconductor industry from an economic perspective as I see it. Let's look at what we've learned so far. See if you can answer these questions. If not, you may need to go review the lecture in a little bit more detail. What are the current Moore's Law doubling rates for logic and for flash? And what's also the previous, the historic, doubling rate for DRAM. What is the fundamental economic principle of Moore's Law? How does it work from an economic perspective? What are the three ways manufacturers have been able to lower the cost per transistor? How do lithography costs scale with wafer size? And compare that to other processes like deposition or etch. And why is Moore's Law getting harder to keep on its path? Well, here's some additional reading. We've got the two Moore's Law papers from Gordon Moore that I mentioned last time, and two more papers as additional reading. Uh, a paper that Gordon Moore wrote in 1995, talking about the history of Moore's Law, and finally a paper I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, talking about the history of Moore's Law as well. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.